Okay, we are live. Give um, people a second to hop on here and then we will get started. Okay, great. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our very first episode of Blue Leadership. Blue Leadership is an initiative that will take you inside the minds and careers of Lepsil faculty and alumni in an engaging interview format that will stream on the Lepsil Facebook page twice a month. The host of Blue Leadership is Lepsil alumnus and faculty and retired chief, Dennis Nair. Thank you all so much for joining us today, whether you are here with us live or watching the replay. Um, please go ahead and utilize that chat feature and say hello and let us know you're here. Um, and with that, I will go ahead and kick it over to our host and um, he will introduce our featured guest. Kylie, thank you. And um, so uh, right now I'm here with a, a man who really needs no introduction, especially to all of those who are you know, in the Lepsil program or have any familiarity with Lepsil. Um, so that's um, academic director, Dr. Eric Fritzfold. Um, just a little bit about um, Dr. Fritzfold for, the, for those who do not know. Um, he's the founding faculty member for Lepsil. Um, to create the program at the very beginning, he did three years of research and collaboration with law enforcement. Um, he's a, been a full-time member of a faculty member of the University of San Diego since 2005. And um, he's a former associate professor of sociology in a crime justice law and society concentration. Um, he served as a department chair and associate dean in the College of Arts and Sciences. And um, he's been recognized by the Princeton Review as one of um, America's 300 best professors. So he has his um, BA in sociology from none other than the University of San Diego, and um, his MA and his PhD in Criminology, Law, and Society from University of California at Irvine. I'm sure I could go on more, but with that, um, Dr. Fritzfeld, thank you for being here. Chief, thanks so much for spearheading this Blue Leadership Initiative, and I'm, I'm honored to be the first guest, so thanks very much. Yeah, it, it was an easy one. When I was asked, you know, which faculty member I'd like to speak to first and, and share with the listeners and viewers, it was easy uh, for it to be you. And and let's kick that off with, as the person who founded the program, you know, can you just talk a little bit about the history of Lepsol, the program, and actually how it came to be? Absolutely. Our origin story is an interesting one, and I think there's some leadership lessons uh, embedded in there. In roughly 2013, two great mentors of mine, um, the Dean of Professional and Continuing Education, Jason Lemon, and an associate dean from our leadership area, George Reed, um, had this idea to create a law enforcement facing master's degree. And I was fortunate enough to uh, be onboarded into that process. And immediately I did my due diligence and I drafted what I thought was a darn good master's degree. It was the master's degree version of my PhD training. It was traditional, it was theory heavy, stats heavy, uh, research methods heavy. It was good training for somebody like me. And to um, Jason and George's credit, we took it out to local stakeholders. And I often say, if you're looking for candid feedback, law enforcement is a good meeting for you. Um, it became clear after our third meeting that we needed to throw it out and start over, that it just wasn't the practical, useful degree we wanted it to be. So long story short, we spent about two years and 55 sit down interviews after throwing that first draft literally in the trash with a tear in my eye, um, walking in the door saying we're the University of San Diego, how can we serve your agency or your association? And we're indebted to those 55 people. Uh, the themes that they told us about leadership, communication, budget um, became our classes. And uh, if it wasn't for that sage advice and good direction, we wouldn't have the program that we had. So it was draft 2.0, not 1.0, that we were particularly proud of. Yeah, and and you know I can speak to that. And just as a um, an alumnus and who was a student in the course at the same time I was a practitioner in the field, I half the time felt that there was a Lepsil camera following me because everything we were covering and learning and studying were all highly applicable and they made sense and it was relevant. And that's it's unique. And especially like you said, law enforcement is a is a, a career type that's continually evolving and to have a program that evolves with it, you just can't find that anywhere. Um, which which kind of goes into our next question and you answered it a little bit, but can you con 
compare and contrast a few of the major differences, um, not only with the program itself, but between working with Lepsil students and the classes and then your undergraduate classes that you teach. Sure. Uh, so I spent about 13 years primarily teaching undergraduates. USD serves a, a traditional undergraduate profile, 18 to 22 or 23 year olds. And of course, I want to teach them the substance of criminology. But I think my larger goal at the undergraduate level is to be a good mentor and a good coach. So it's less important in my view, like what major they choose. But my goal is to teach them a young adult process for choosing a major. Um, so I think you're more uh, assisting them as they transition into young adulthood through the lens of academia. Um, in contrast, in the Lepsil program, as you know, we're serving probably the nation's most capable law enforcement student body. Um, when I wake up in the morning and I log into the classes, I can't believe I have the opportunity to work with students and faculty of this caliber. So working with Lepsil students, we have to bat a thousand. Our curriculum has to be cutting edge from admissions to onboarding, to the orientation, to the faculty experience. Um, it all has to be proportional to the skills and experience and sacrifices that those students are making. They're adults, typically mid-career, high achieving students investing their own time and money. So we want to respect that level of investment by giving them a, a program that's immediately useful. So, uh, the lens through which you see the two experiences is much different. One, I, I see myself more as a mentor at the undergraduate level here. My job is to facilitate the amazing experience that students bring in the classroom. And, and I just say it shows. And, you know, I, I speak for my colleagues who have been through the program. And, and for those who are considering the program, that is such an important part of it, because I think people who are practitioners in the field, especially at the command level, and they're living this profession daily, to know that the person who's teaching them at the highest levels of criminology understands and gets that. And um, it, it really is, is something that makes the program, I think, one of the um, premier programs because of that feature that you've brought to it. And, and that kind of goes, again, if it's comprised mostly of full-time active command members of law enforcement, this is a, maybe it might even have a little humor in here. Can you share a couple of stories that you can recall that have come through the people who are maybe they're covering an, um, an intense homicide investigation or they're dealing with some administrative uh, major issue and they have a paper due and they're in the discussion boards. What are a couple stories that come to mind? Oh, there are so many. Um, I will say my favorite experiences with students is meeting their families at graduation because that's ultimately who we're serving. We're asking that law enforcement professional to take time away from his or her family, take money away from his or her family. And speaking to families at graduation, it makes me feel so good when we've um, they've seen an immediate payoff with skill set, with career development, with promotion. So that's my favorite stories are, are meeting the, the families. Um, I got a couple. Uh, one and this just happened, uh, a, a chief in the state just sent me a report that's his official agency's report to the community that's actually its origin is in an iterative class project. So as you know, we have the Lepsil 520 Community Engagement Project. It's built around the 2015 Presidential Task Force on 21st Century Policing. And our goal is not just to have students just do assignments to check a box. But this is, I believe, the ninth or 10th student who has created this report about what, what their agencies are doing in terms of technology, officer wellness, uh, community engagement, and packaging it in a visually interesting way. And it goes up their chain of command and becomes the official report. So um, that's the, the academic answer. I'll try to give you the funny answer. Early days of Lepsil, 2016, one class has a group project. Uh, students work together to write uh, an MOU for a multi-agency gangs task force or human trafficking task force. And they're in teams uh, typically of four. And the very first time we did this project, it was a true group project. Four students, one product, they all got the same grade. Um, 
And I had a, a local homicide detective who was one of the single best students in our inaugural class. Um, he's a detective. So he found my undergraduate office hours and sat in the back of the room. And I had a busy office hours that day. So we sat for maybe 90 minutes as I took care of, you know, the business of being an undergraduate professor, uh, helped all the undergrads. And he had kindly, he had a laptop and some hard copies and had color coded. He was his team's leader and he had color coded the drafts he got from his group members and then the sections that he felt compelled to rewrite to get up to his standards. And so in a super organized way, he spent about 45 minutes walking me through the paperwork that essentially says you need to reconceptualize this project because I felt compelled to, you know, maybe take the 94% level work he was getting and make it the 99% caliber he wanted to submit. Um, and I'll just never forget him sitting in the back of the room, certain look on his face, you know, kind of a grizzled homicide detective look on his face, just patiently waiting to make his case. Um, so moving forward, that project now requires, uh, we did a little inventory from students and faculty group cooperation, but largely as an individual grade, thanks to that homicide detective kindly walking me through that evidence. But I'll just never forget him sitting and patiently waiting. Pretty cool yeah. experience. That's that's awesome. And it's awesome to see that the input from the students affects the program and it'll continue. Like we talked a little off camera that any project in its infancy will always be different in its later stages because anything good will always evolve. And that's a great example for here. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about the discussion boards, because, again, I'll say from my point of view, that was one of the best parts of the program. It helped the students realize that they're not alone in whatever situation they're dealing with. Um, not only do they get to kind of share or commiserate in whatever the challenge of the time is, but they also learn answers and they get different um, perspectives and ways to do things. But a question is, so this, this program has students from across the country, but sometimes you might have two students from the same agency. And maybe you have a student whose supervisor is in the or commanding level members in the class with them. How do you make it that the people can have the freedom and, and feel safe in their responses, whether it's to a prompt of what the original question is or to the discussion threads that people do not feel that they can't speak honestly and candidly? Phenomenal question. And I agree. The discussion boards are the most valuable part of the program, leveraging that experience from across the country. Um, it's a pleasure just to do your best to facilitate that. Uh, Two-pronged answer for you, Chief. First, the team and I spend, it's about eight to 10 hours, if not more, per semester, individually placing individual students into their individual classes. So the math doesn't always work, but we do our best to control for conflicts of interest, GPA, level of experience in the room, region, past performance. Um, so we make sure we do our very best to maximize the chances that a, a lieutenant wouldn't be in the same room as a same classroom as a sergeant from that same agency. Uh, we've gotten that consistent feedback from students that they preferred to um, not have their commanding officers in the same class. But the second thing we do, and this is a best practice largely spearheaded by uh, Captain Mike Laurie, who's been on our faculty team nearly since the inception of the program. And he encourages all of us to embrace our leadership point of view. So as he conceptualizes that, when a student is talking about the challenging issues of the day or maybe a leadership vacuum in his or her department, that we don't want the discussion boards just to be a, a rant and venting related to that issue. There's a place for that. This just isn't the place. According to Professor Lori, you want to take that student's challenge with that issue, whether it's, it's defunding or recruitment and retention, real challenging issues, and have them look at it proactively. What would they do if they were the chief or sheriff of their organization? How can they proactively face this challenge? And so to speak to your question, our hope is that if there is a regional student who maybe they cross paths with professionally, they'll respect the fact that that student identified an issue, attacked it proactively, leveraged course material, and weren't just complaining about it, that they were solutions oriented. So that's the two pronged answer, uh, individually placing students into classes and two, embracing that Professor Laurie leadership point of view. And, and, and yet again, just another example of how 
there is no stone unturned and just making it so that students can learn, cannot feel that sort of stress that may incur or actually would incur if they had somebody in their um, class that they couldn't feel comfortable speaking freely. So I think that's awesome. Um, and if you don't mind me jumping in, that was something we didn't know at the beginning. We thought maybe two folks from the same agency would want to go through the classes together. Um, but again, we, the overwhelming majority of students said that they preferred a different model. So we went in that direction. And I know actually, and I know you even do it with even neighboring agencies because still it just could create a conflict. And again, I just think that's such diligence toward caring about the student's learning experience. Um, so for planning purposes, what type of planning do you, obviously you as the person who I, I couldn't even imagine there's 168 hours in a week, you probably have 165 devoted to this program. And I just want to know what type of planning goes into making it such that the information is relevant and also timely to, to. Great question. I just had a little internet hiccup here. Um, so at any moment, we're doing three things at the same time. We're doing an after action report and debriefing on the class that just ran, those student surveys, formal and informal feedback. We're executing the current course and we're building not the next course, but the one after that to make sure we're a little ahead of the game. Um, so every week we're debriefing a module, teaching a module and building a module in three different classes. Uh, we're fortunate to be in an administrative structure, which is pretty unique in academia, to be very agile. A um, couple faculty, myself, a uh, few Lepsel admin folks, we sit in a room, we make decisions, and we move forward. We gather evidence. We do it systematically, but we don't have 10 committee meetings. We have to move at the speed of business and your business, which is incredibly challenging. Um, so more tangibly, those student surveys play a huge role. Uh, myself and the faculty team are embedded in different elements of the law enforcement community. So we go to conferences, we get newsletters, we get reports um, to stay on the cutting edge of the industry. But the most important thing is the network that I now have hundreds of faculty, students and alumni. And I, I know enough in their areas of expertise where if we have a particular need in a class or a module that was good, but not great, um, I know exactly who I can turn to for direction and advice. So um, we think the key to keeping things contemporary is to first and foremost, be good listeners and then leverage that community expertise to put just the right person in the room or in the module or on video to speak to that issue. And I probably have 50 examples of how we've done that with a particular subject matter expert, but that's the biggest differentiating, differentiating factor for this program. It's also the most challenging. And, and with that challenge, so how long would you say it would take you to build a course around, let's look at 2020, a year in which no playbook existed? I mean, there are so many nuances. Every one of them could be a course, whether it's the topic of the funding, whether it's the civil unrest, um, dealing with a pandemic, the um, synergistic effect of all of those. How you probably are even in the process of talking about it. How long would it take to build a course that would then have that relevance? First run one module should take us about two weeks and then if we were a little more comfortable second run it should take us about one week um but whether it's the the lepsil 500 contemporary issues course that's explicitly designed to react like that or is it weaving defunding into the current budget course to keep it top topical and timely um but all the issues that you mentioned are on the horizon in the next eight to 12 months in the program um uh, what some people refer to as activist DAs, um, defunding will continue. COVID, when COVID first started, our classes were more about the immediate reaction to COVID. Now it's about COVID as a study and organizational change and leadership and lessons learned. Um, if we as a program aren't proactively and consciously adapting to this dynamic landscape, we're not serving you as well as we can. So, um, Again, constant challenge. You wake up in the morning excited about it. Um, like any problem, you gather evidence and you throw labor at it. Yeah, well, it's done well through Lepsil and through you and your colleagues. Um, and, and with that, so where Lepsil started back in 2015, 16, to where it is now, and, and I graduated in 2020 and I 
couldn't speak highly enough about the program because it was that good. And I know it's even going to evolve more. So this question is, what is your vision for the future of Lepsol, um, yeah, the evolution of it, the growth of it? Where do you want to take it? That's a phenomenal question. I kind of a micro answer and a macro answer. The, the micro answer is to continue this listening first adaptation mantra. Um, we feel like we really have something special here. If we can take a, a student and now faculty at your caliber, two chiefs positions, a research position in the middle, um, professional academic skill set, if we can serve you and the Lepsel community well, uh, we must be doing something right. And we have to first continue that momentum. So we have to continue to execute the high standards that already exist. But number two, and here's here's the big answer, Chief. Um, we feel part of respecting the way our program has been received in the law enforcement community is to think about how we can leverage Lepsel to make a difference. I think you get involved in academia for many of the same reasons you get involved in law enforcement, to try to make a difference. I think we're doing a good job in the classroom. But to answer your question, I could envision Lepsel becoming the West Coast PERF, the Police Executive Research Forum, where we um, have three-day workshops on uh, and conferences on a topical issue. You write a policy report. We work with legislators. Um, that I couldn't think of in this era of law enforcement in particular, there's no one better positioned to shape the next 20 years of the law enforcement profession than the Lepsel community and students like yourselves and all the leaders that you've gotten to work with in the classroom and the faculty. So while I'd be excited about other degrees that serve the law enforcement program, bachelor's degrees, PhDs, I think long run, big picture, we should be the West Coast perf and not only execute high quality programming in the classroom, but provide our students another bullhorn to help shape the future of the state and the country, because we're just so blown away by the, the skills that they bring to the table. So I think that's the answer, West Coast Perf. Yeah, and I, I think that would be great. And one of the things that have come up in contemporary policing, and um, it's, it's so important is national standards. And I think a lot of times people look at national standards for just the entry level of officer. But I really think we got to go a step further. And there should be national standards for what it takes to be a police chief. And you look at what people go through through this program. I mean, whether you're, you know, you're learning your, your constitutional public safety law courses or you're learning budgeting or community engagement, whatever, conflict resolution, everything ties in to skills that a police chief needs. And I, I foresee um, in the big picture that Lepsel could be looked at as a, a high level prerequisite, almost like they look at the FBI National Academy or, you know, um, uh, some other leading command based training. And um, I, I can see that as being a key part of this picture. Uh, I appreciate that shared vision that apparently we both have. And again, that goal is just a byproduct of the caliber, forward thinking, progressive mindset. Um, that you see every day in the classroom. So how we are going to respect the capabilities of, of our students, faculty, and community, I think, is by thinking big like this. So um, we'll, uh, let's put together a proposal, let's say, by Monday, and we'll get working on it. Let's do it. And, and this will, you know, I am always respectful of the viewer's time and the, you know, the attention um, time in which people have had enough listening to um, people talking on any topic, whatever it is. So I want to wrap up with what your final thoughts are um, that you'd like to add, anything I didn't ask, anything you want to expand on? Uh, first, I just want to reiterate my thanks to you and the team for spearheading this Blue Leadership Initiative. Uh, I'm excited for um, how that will let the community learn a little bit more about this program. Um, I think I'll, I'll reiterate with a thank you that I never envisioned as an academic criminologist the opportunity to, to work with law enforcement professionals. I just came into this job as, as the average person without much experience with police. And I've just been so struck by that experience. I wish more people in America got to have it. Um, just to see, again, the forward thinking, community facing, progressive ideals that are gonna shape the future of this profession. So it's, uh, again, I wake up in the morning, I can't believe this is my job. 
I thank you for your career of service, all our students and faculty for their career service. And uh, we're going to do our very best to continue to deliver uh, the educational value that we do as a result. So it's a big thank you is my big finish, Chief. And, and, and right back at you, Dr. Fritzvold. Thank you. Again, you make this program what it is. It's valuable to all. Um, I hope the viewers, if they know people who are interested in um, getting a higher education and a degree, um, that they really look into this program and they understand that um, undergraduate credits will transfer in and that they can actually, um, or some, um, excuse me, some master's credits will transfer in if they have some already, and that they can really consider this because it is the program for people who want to accelerate their law enforcement career and just be better practitioners. So thank you. You're muted, Kylie. Great. Thank you both. <laughs> uh, thank you, everyone who is watching live and watching the replay. We appreciate you taking the time out of your day to join us, and we will see you all next time. Have a great rest of your week, everyone.